It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. There's an old saying, breaking up is hard to do. According to today's guest, Amy Chan, while breaking up can be painful, the heartbreak can be transformed into healing. With a dose of tough love, Amy offers advice that can help anyone turn their greatest heartbreak into a powerful opportunity for growth. Amy is the founder of Renew Breakup Bootcamp, the relationship magazine Just My Type, and she runs a private coaching business in New York City. She blogs for the Huffington Post and is the author of the book, Breakup Bootcamp, the science of rewiring your heart. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Amy, let's start off by talking a little bit about your life and how you got started on the journey of helping others with their relationships. Yeah, uh, about 10 years ago, I was in a relationship and I thought I was living the dream. And to me back then, living the dream was date, get married, and live happily forever after. And I was on my way. And uh Then one day that relationship fell apart through infidelity. And when that relationship fell apart, I fell apart. I had put so much of my identity in him and us that um, I didn't know who I was. I had panic attacks. I had thoughts of suicide. And it was a very dark space for me. And I did everything I could to heal. And it was a long, uh, really challenging journey. But once I, you know, went, got onto the other side, I realized that I needed to create something to help other people who are going through this sort of pain so that they could learn the tools to navigate heartbreak and that they can actually use that heartbreak to kind of transform and shift their life. What you just described, your experience, I think that that's common for a lot of people, women in particular. I I know what happened in my life. I was groomed to, you know, go to college and then get a, a job and start a career, but it was really not my true profession because my real profession was to be the wife and mother to the family I would create. And I dutifully did what was expected of me. And for 23 years, I was that perfect wife and mother. And when I woke up in middle age and I realized, you know, who am I? What happened to me? And it was in Mm -hmm. that Mm self-discovery, trying to figure out what I wanted and what I needed that my 23-year marriage ended because I was changing the dynamics of what I had created in our relationship. And so like you, I was left feeling depressed and anxious. And, you know, having done that for so many years, I didn't even know how I would support myself. So I think the work that you're doing is so relevant because it is such a common story. Yeah, Joan, I think your story and my story are, there's a lot of similarities. And I think a lot of people can resonate because, you know, from a a very young age, we are socialized by the fairy tales, the love songs, the movies that give us an idea of, of what successful love is, right? And there's this idea that a success in a relationship means happily forever after. And I don't think that that's the benchmark for a successful relationship. Our relationships are here, they could be here for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. You know, there's some relationships that, that you go through that teach you what you don't want so that you can create space to explore what you do want. And I agree. I mean, I was groomed as well. I, I groomed myself to be perfect, the perfect girlfriend, so one day I could be the perfect wife. And it wasn't until I had that breakup that I, you know, stopped. And I was like, wait, whose ideas are these? Are these mine? Is it, or did I just kind of adapt them through osmosis, through looking at my parents and through society and these cultural norms? And it wasn't until I realized I have a blank canvas how do I want to paint this canvas that I felt empowered to write the next chapter of my life? My life wasn't ending because this chapter of the relationship was ending. 
And I did the same thing that you did, Amy. I had to rewrite my life as well. But as you know, when you go through a loss of a significant relationship, the pain can be unfathomable. And oftentimes people say, I'm never going through that again. And they shut down. They close themselves off to the world and to love again. So how does a person do, as you say in the title of your book, how does someone begin to rewire his or her heart? Yeah, there's different stages of 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 grief and separation. And so I think first it's important to understand that you're going to go through all the stages and you might jump around because healing is not linear. There are six main stages. It starts off with shock, then denial, then sadness slash depression. Then it moves into anger. And then you might go back into denial and maybe even a relapse. And this is when you're like, oh, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad. Maybe I should give it another try. And then maybe enough times of doing that and getting the same outcome, you finally get to a stage of acceptance. And unfortunately, you can't fast forward through any of those stages. You, you're going to bounce around, but you need to go through them. And the very first stage, you need to allow yourself to process the emotions. You know, if you break your leg, it's very standard. You know, you go to the doctor, you might get a cast. You're not going to remove the cast and run a marathon right away. We need to deal with matters of the heart the same way. We have to be gentle with ourselves. We can't judge our emotions as good or bad and allow ourselves to process them instead of distracting and avoiding the emotions. Um, I think it's also common for people to kind of get stuck into psychoanalyzing and going into, you know, thinking and rumination because it's a way of escaping um, processing the emotions. And so I would, you know, warn people to not do that either. The, you know, the next stage is when you can start to reflect and look at what are the emotional experiences that keep repeating and then look at what are those patterns so that you can start shifting them. I think what you said is so important because you just described the grief model and often people don't give themselves time to heal. It's like they jump from one relationship to the next without taking the time to say, okay, what went wrong here? What do I need to do to change the way I view a relationship and what am I willing to accept or not accept from my next relationship? Yeah, exactly. Because Jumping to another relationship right away or is a way of avoiding dealing with your feelings. They're uncomfortable, so you distract yourself. And there's many different vices, whether it's you know going back into dating, whether it's alcohol, whether it's party. And, and all these ways are just avoiding dealing with our stuff. And the thing is, there's compound trauma, right? Because this whole learning the tools and the patterns, because it's never just about the ex. It's recycled pain. And if you don't deal with that pain, if you don't heal those original wounds, They're just going to follow you from relationship to relationship. You know, they talk about first-time divorce rates. I I don't know the exact statistics, but it's something around 50%. And then the second marriage divorce rate, I think it's about 60, 63. And then I think the third jumps into the 70s. And I hope I'm not too far off on my numbers. But that shows you the trend of not learning the lessons from a relationship, that you're going to repeat those patterns. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. When we, ha- when we are young, we actually develop our internal GPS of who we're drawn to and who we're repulsed by. If you didn't have a healthy model of what love looks like and feels like, you actually, your psyche actually, as an adult, recreates the scenario of the crime in an attempt to, to change its ending. And this is done on a subconscious level. And this is why you see people jump from relationship to relationship or marriage to marriage, and they haven't dealt with those original wounds because subconsciously they're trying to just recreate the scenario with it now a different person in an attempt to change its ending. And so it's so important that we do the work up front to start healing those wounds so that we start changing the relationship outcomes. So then if we start to assess what it is we want and what we don't want from our next relationship, what are some tips then that you offer to help us cultivate that lasting, loving, strong relationship? I think the very first thing is identifying what is your definition of love. Because a lot of what we have been fed since we've been young children is not love, right? The Romeo and Juliet story, the the love songs, the fairy tales, they paint a picture of love that is actually, you know, lust and codependency. <clears throat> and so we can equate intensity and chaos and you know, push and pull with love when that's not love at all. And if we don't identify that this isn't love, that can set us up to actually you know, dismiss potential partners because we're like, oh, you're boring, this isn't exciting enough. And that can make us chase people who are exciting and full of intensity, but it's completely not love. 
And it can also cause us when we're in a relationship and things are stable and it moves from the honeymoon phase into the more, you know, um, companionate love stage, which is, which is fueled by different chemicals, um, which is oxytocin and vasopressin. Those are the bonding chemicals. You might think, oh, something's wrong in my relationship because you're not feeling that crazy intensity and that obsession anymore. But you're not realizing that this is a natural life cycle of how love goes. It starts off maybe fueled by dopamine and intensity, and then it can move into something more stable and peaceful. And so I think that's important to reframe what your ideas of love is. When you were describing how you had set up your life to be the perfect wife and, and everything had to be perfect, and I set up my life to be the perfect wife and mother, and you know, we set these really unrealistic expectations for ourselves. And, and when you live your life that way, you tend to give up who you are and what you want. So in cultivating a strong relationship, how important is self-care and self-love, putting yourself in the equation? Disempowerment sneaks up on us. And when we lose ourselves, it's not like one day we're like, okay, I'm going to get in this relationship and I'm just going to you know, stop doing my hobbies. I'm going to stop building and cultivating my community. And I'm just going to be completely codependent. It doesn't happen that way. It happens death by a thousand cuts. And so it's really important that if you have tendencies to try to merge with your partner or kind of lose yourself in your relationship, you need to actually have check-ins regularly with yourself to maintain balance. And I really, you know, I do this exercise in the book and at my breakup boot camps is draw a circle. And in that circle, slice up, you know, how much time you devote to your relationship and to the other things that are important in your life. And if that slice of pie devoted to your relationship, is it 50%, 70%, 80%? I work with people where sometimes they do this exercise and 80, 90% of their slice of pie is devoted to the relationship. So of course, after a breakup, they feel like their whole world is turned upside down. And, you know, if they don't get proactive with filling up that space, uh, that 90%, they, they fill it up with thoughts of their ex. And so if you're even in a relationship right now, it's not too late. Look at that balance. Is it off balance? And then how can you actually, you know, nurture your friendships, nurture your hobbies, nurture your own identity outside of your relationship, you know, and your partnership? Because this is super important because otherwise we start to feel disempowered. And when we're disempowered, there's an uneven power dynamic, and that eventually causes problems to come to the surface. That's the, the greatest piece of advice that I give to young people, uh, women in particular, who are embarking on marriage or, or getting into a, a you know, a, a very a deep lasting relationship, I always say to them, I don't regret giving all that I had to my family and the way I raised my children. But what I do regret is what I allowed to have happen to myself. And, and like you're saying, putting yourself in there, doing things that nurture you, it really is the greatest gift that you can give to your loved ones. Because when your well is full, you have more to give. And, and I think that that's something that people really need to pay attention to. Yeah, and if we ignore our own self-care and, you know, doing those practices daily that cultivate compassion, that cultivate gratitude, the, you know, our emotional health level, you know, starts to, to get lower. And who we're drawn to and who we draw in is going to match our own emotional health level. And so if you're not healthy yourself, it is going to be really difficult to draw in and maintain a healthy relationship. So yes, put the life mask on yourself first because you are not doing a service to anyone by ignoring your own needs and neglecting your own self-care. So Amy, we're living through some very strange times right now. And anyone who's trying to find love or date between a pandemic and social isolation and quarantining, how does someone go about doing that in the world we live in? I think that the pandemic, there is a silver lining in dating because this is our, our time to actually kind of reevaluate if what we've been doing up till now has been working. And, and so this is our opportunity to actually get off of that treadmill that we've been running on and start changing. And so if you haven't been happy with your relationship outcomes, don't keep doing the same thing. It's like as if you're baking a cake and you know that a dairy, you know, a cake made with dairy makes you sick. But you're like, you know what, I'm just going to keep using milk and I'm not going to make almond milk because that's too hard to do. But you're constantly, you know, unhappy with this cake that makes you sick. Do the work up front 
to start to change the ingredients of what you're putting into the cake. So assess what are your patterns right now? What are you repeating? What are the values that are important to you? And, you know, right now you might want to conduct a dating experiment. Date 10 different people who are outside of your type. That might mean you'd set up FaceTime dates or Skype dates and you swipe on people you normally wouldn't give a chance to and you kind of expand your ideas of what you think your type is. Because we all have this list on a cognitive level, you might be they have to have this height or they must make this amount of money. And we really stop ourselves from giving a chance to people that we might be really compatible with because we have these ideas of who we think we should be with. So this is a time, and when you conduct a dating experiment, you also take away the pressure of, I need to meet the one. All you wanna do in this experiment is you know, build your muscle of, of creating curiosity. Build your muscle of creating connection with another person. Have fun with it. And, you know, that kind of makes lightens the mood and makes dating a fun thing because you're, you're working on just building your connection skills versus this daunting pressure of, I need to meet the one. And in doing this, this new age of more virtual dating, is there any advice that you can offer to someone to help him or her put their best foot forward or, or their, you know, security concerns they need to be aware of? Is this changing the dynamics of dating? I think it's important to, uh, you know, do FaceTime, don't just do phone because, yes, you can get catfished and, and so you want to be careful with that. But you also don't go in and, and look for the red flags because, look, if you're looking for all the red flags, you're going to find them. And so you want to really just be as open and curious as you possibly can. And in that conversation, you will sense if there is some chemistry. And you might not sense it's romantic chemistry because sometimes on a cognitive level, it takes time for you to process that there's romantic chemistry. All you want to ask yourself is, hey, am I having fun? Do I want to talk to this person again? And if so, that warrants another you know, virtual date. And, and hopefully enough virtual dates until you build enough of uh, a connection and emotional connection where hopefully when it's safe to do so that you can meet in person. Um, but don't write people off so quickly. I think that's the number one thing. I think we are surrounded by people that could be potential partners, but too often we're dismissing people way too quickly. The book is Breakup Boot Camp, The Science of Rewiring Your Heart. If you'd like to get more information about Amy and her work, you can visit renewbreakupbootcamp.com. Amy, in our final moments, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I think the greatest lesson in our lifetime is to practice opening our heart, even when it hurts, especially when it hurts. So whatever you're going through, whether you're going through a breakup or just the pain and stress of this pandemic, try to not put walls around your heart. Know that you can learn the tools to get back up, to be you know, cultivate resilience so that you can love with an open heart because you're doing yourself and the world a disservice by going through life by being jaded and having walls around your heart. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.